to start with that. Um, what my focus is, is this week we're playing. Growing up in a holiness Pentecostal home, I was taught you give your testimony to those who are asking about Christianity. And so that's what we did. We didn't know anything else. We give a testimony. We tell how bad we were and then Christ saved us and look how good we are now. Well, the fact is that's a very subjective approach. And it gives no absolute truth. Because you can get a, a lady who's gone through AA, prior to AA, lived a horrific life, goes to AA, her God is the doorknob, because they let you choose who your God is, and so she improves her life. Does that mean she's a Christian? Is that the gospel? No, that's moral and ethical improvements. And so when you give your testimony, and I, I know most of you are Lutheran, but some of you I talked to grew up actually Pentecostal. And so when you give your testimony of your adult conversion in the Pentecostal realm, that's your focus. And then later on you get to Jesus. But your primary focus is your testimony. We all have experiences with God. I'm not saying you don't. What I'm saying is, if you are bringing the person on the path of apologetics to the house of salvation, where Dr. Montgomery says, is the door of salvation. You have to remove the hindrances. And when you begin, you might start with, well, for me as an adult convert, I remember the day that Christ showed me from his word that I was a sinner, needed salvation but I need to get off that step into the next ones, which are the evidential and documentary proofs, the eyewitnesses, the historical aspect, because my testimony is subjective. So that's where we're gonna go with this. Now, let me make sure I get the slides right. Okay. And while our experience might be a starting point, you don't wanna stay there. So, I have a couple of quotes here and verses and Gandalf, <laughs> you shall not pass. What do I mean by that? I'm gonna really mess up what it really meant in the book, so I apologize. But it, I took it to mean you don't go beyond where you're supposed to. And scripture says that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. And then Dr. Montgomery said to me, when we were discussing this thesis, bad theology results in a debilitated gospel proclamation. And it does. Um, and then one of my favorite Lutheran hymns is, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. And as I was doing this research, I came across two people who truly helped me, even though they were already in heaven. One was my Sunday school teacher back in the Pentecostal church who had gone to Harvard and she eventually became the historian for the Assemblies of God. Well, she passed away just a few months after I started doing this thesis in 2019. And next thing I knew, I had a box of her research on the men I'm going to talk about today. Because she was looking at them as having set the Pentecostal movement on a wrong course. And remember, she was the Assemblies of God's historian. The other gentleman was Reverend Arthur J. Clement, and he wrote two different books on the charismatic and Pentecostal movements. And he had a lot of research. And then I had also a lot of research because of um, actually doing apologetics within the church, when I began to move from Pentecostalism to Charismatic to Dutch Reform, and I landed in Lutheran. Um, so with regard to um, Gandalf's statement, you don't go outside of what scripture has given us as a pattern to defend the faith and proclaim the faith. I am not saying Pentecostals aren't saved. 
Now, if you're a oneness Pentecostal, then we got a Trinitarian issue and we can sit down and, and discuss that. But I believe Pentecostals have been saved. It's just their way of doing evangelism and theology and apologetics has been skewed because it was initially skewed. Another quote from Dr. Montgomery in the Christianity in a Corner. He said, when the churches preach its own opinion instead of the word of God, it signs its own death warrant. And it does. Because if we're not giving the gospel, if we're not, um, I believe Dr. Williams said that we need to land on scripture, we're not doing that, then <clears throat> the point of even defending the faith or proclaiming it is huge. Okay, so the road I traveled, uh, I said I started Holiness Pentecostal, German Holiness Pentecostal, which is a whole other thing. Um, but as I began to move um, from theological position to another, it was because I was asking, where is that in the Bible? And isn't that where we're supposed to go when people ask us about Christ? So um, I began to move up in the ranks of the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, Mike Fickle, if any of you are familiar with his name, Kansas City Prophet, had sent a lady out, and she happened to be in a summer camp where my husband and I were, and she was praying that I would have Fickle's anointing. And the next year, I had nightmare after nightmare after nightmare. Um, and I began to ask, well, what is this anointing? And they couldn't answer me. Why? Because First John tells us all Christians have it. So they weren't going to scripture, which made me dig even deeper. And I began to think about my questions. And my husband, with his great dry sense of humor, said, if you get the questions up to 95, we'll nail them on Evangel's church door. <laughs> I said, I think I can do that. I have like a stack of questions that was not being answered because it was all subjective. It was all experience. It wasn't biblically based. So I ended up writing Modern 95. Most of this is from there, um, but then I added to it when I found more research. Um, so the reason I wrote it is I was checking my own foundation for faith in Christ. And I had to keep going to the scriptures for a reason to believe, right? That's what we've been told. So if I have a reason that is objective, then I can give the other person an objective answer. And I don't have to tell them my subjective experience. Now, if they ask, I will certainly share. I grew up in a Christian home, but it wasn't until I was 19 that God opened my eyes to the fact that I was a sinner and needed salvation. But I moved from there to the evidences to the objective truth. I love this little theme. That theology, it'll hurt you. Not only was I having uh, demonic nightmares, but even when I then moved to Calvinism, another theology stream, I began to have panic attacks because I had no assurance that I was the elect. I was filled with fear. And mind you, I was running a women's ministry in the church we were attending. Women are coming to me saying, how do I know I'm elect? My answer was, look to Christ. Do you think I listened to my own answer? No, because I had been trained to look at my experience instead of looking solely to Christ. So I had voices in my head. I said false prophecies in Deuteronomy 18, if you want to look it up, it should have been done on me. Um, and that anointing couldn't be defined. Everything was intranose instead of extranose. I kept looking inside subjective instead of 
outside myself. Jesus became the side note of witnessing. In church on Friday nights at the Pentecostal church, they'd have testimony time, and you would give your testimony of how bad you were and how much you have changed. So everything was focused on me. Look at the changes God has done in me. How many of you know that what your heart actually looks like? But you're not going to tell them because that wouldn't be a good testimony for Jesus. So you got to kind of cover that up. And that's what I would do. Um, and it was Dr. Montgomery's course at Trinity online. I went for a counseling degree. After the first paper I submitted, whoever was grading it said, you need to look at apologetics instead. I didn't even know what it was. I was like, why am I apologizing? Saying this Tara said to me. Um, but it began to have me ask more and more, where's that the Bible? How do I know it's true? Because it's in the Bible. Because we have eyewitnesses. Because we have documentary evidence. We have historical evidence. I love the Dorothy Sayers quote that we have a God who came in history in a tiny history. So back to Pentecostalism and some of the founders. <laughs> Experience is my creed. That is from the introduction of this book by a Pentecostal man, Thinking in the Spirit. Experience is my creed. Well, every one of us has had a different experience. So you believe because of your experience, or do you believe because that's what the Bible tells you? And I remember going to my pastor when he came with right, and I would pepper him with questions. He would say, let's see what the Bible says about this question. It would bother me in the beginning, but now I find such comfort to understand that we have an objective truth, and it doesn't matter how I feel, because it's true, simply because it's God's truth. And so, um, as I was looking into this further, I realized that your experience is your emotions, and emotions are a pretty sandy foundation. Again, I'll go back to my carpenter husband, that if you don't have a solid foundation for floor joists or for a wall, you're not really going to want to live in that house. And so I wanted to look at my Pentecostal belief when I wrote, when I was growing up into my mid-30s and say, how can I help my Pentecostal friends realize they've taken a, a, a wrong approach? They're emphasizing their experience, their uh, immediate revelations from God, instead of going to God's direct revelation through his written word. And so that's what we're going to look at. And then what difference does it make then? I mean, they're saved. Let them tell their story. Because their story is not the gospel. Your testimony, your experience is not the gospel. I teach my five-year-old Sunday school students, the gospel is this. Jesus died for your sins. And if you don't land on that, even when you're talking with unbelievers, you didn't give them the gospel. Your apologetic failed. Because you didn't end with the information that they desperately need. Instead, you kind of hung out in your experience. So what happened was you don't have objective truth points, which are verifiable facts, eyewitness testimony, documentary proofs, and fulfilled prophecies. Instead, you have unverified emotions, experiential opinions, and direct revelation outside of the scripture. Merriam-Webster says a doctrine where individual feeling or attention is the ultimate criterion of the good and right, and that's what subjectivism is. Subjectivism is your. It's about you. Objective truth from the scripture 
is about what God has done in Christ, as we say in the 19th Creed, came down for us and for our salvation. But if you're worried about giving your testimony as you're evangelizing, that's all subjective. You know, the Mormon comes into the house and you're talking with them and you say, well, I've got this joy just welling up. Well, I got a burning bosom. So it's no different. It's no different. And um, so we're going to kind of move on from that. Oh, I love Joe Friday. You know, some of you might be young, you don't know the show. <laughs> but Joe Friday was a detective and he would just say, just the facts, damn. And that's really what we're giving them. We need to give them the truth. Yes, you can explain how Christ changes your life. But why? How? Because God came down here to be our savior. It's not about your emotions. It's not about your experience. Although I have to say some Lutheran hymns make me want to hit my knees more than any Pentecostal hymn I ever saw. So emotions are involved. And I'm not saying touch yourself from that. But um, what happened was the rule of faith cradle was replaced by the rule of my heart. So it promoted feelings. It testifies about our experience. It interprets the scripture in light of that experience. Truthfulness of the gospel is based on outward feelings, emotions, and experiences. And it creates, and here's the slippery slope, it creates a need to find God's word somewhere else. So then you get prophecies and visions and dreams and sages instead of this is what God's word says. Biblical objectivism says it promotes facts in evidence, confesses what the apostles witnessed. Scripture interprets scripture. Truthfulness of the gospel is bait of the New Testament is based on the gospel and the writers who were actually there. Now, some modern day prophets may say that I've seen the resurrected Jesus. Really? Really? Why would you need to do that if everything we need for life and godliness is contained in God's word? So, all right. Um, again, their truth, almost sound like the liberals today. That's your truth. This is my truth. Their truth is verified by experience. Our truth, Christian's truth, is based on the objective truths of God's word. And we can't make anything else take that primary spot. So when you do an experience-based message, presentations can be weakened. They can also kind of stir up the fervor. And then you get people coming down the aisle to decide for Jesus, and they go home and they live like what they were before. I don't tell my testimony any more in detail unless someone actually asks. You know why? Because my sister also was an adult convert. Mine was super exciting. It changed me so much. My poor boss at the time thought I had a mental breakdown. That's how black and white my life was from the night before to the next day of work. My sister, she didn't have that. So then people start wanting what I have because that's exciting. Wow, that's a change. With my sister, um, okay. So I don't tell the details of my conversion anymore because that's subjective. Instead, I proclaim Christ and him crucified, died, buried, and rose again. And I got 500 witnesses in Paul who tells the Corinthians, if you doubt what I'm saying, go ask them. Those were the eyewitnesses. Um, they also, again, I said, hear from, from God apart from the written scripture, visions, dreams, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, words of knowledge, and new apostles. Get a brand new, whole new set of apostles. And that's, again, another one of the slippery slopes that Pentecostals need to stay away from. 
we need to not be looking at that. We need to be looking at the scripture. You want to watch your time very carefully. Mm -hmm. All right. Your teaching of personal revelation, how many revelations have they had? How is your message verified by God? And is there more than one word of God for everybody? Everyone gets their own direct communication from God. And then how do Pentecostals respond to other groups with extra biblical revelations, such as Muslim, Mormon, Hindu, Sikh, Jain? And there's a whole storm on those. So the dangers of extra biblical is the preaching of scripture needs to focus on the heart of scripture. Faith. Error begets error. Again, back to my husband's carpentry. Um, that bottom part of the wall or your doorway, if it's not perfectly right, you're going to have a bad door. You have a door that leans, breaks, whatever. So these three men, Edward Irving, John Alexander Dowie, and Charles Parham, are all the originators of Pentecostalism. Let's get to that. This is why I say go to your origins. So, instead of looking to objective truth, they began to look for truth in subjective revelations. They had a focus on eschatology instead of soteriology. Jesus would be returning soon. This is 18. 30s, long before Azusa Street in the early 20th century. So you're looking at 70 years before Azusa Street when Pentecostalism arose. Um, they felt, well, as long as Jesus has the offices of prophet and apostles, <coughs> he can return. And we don't look at creeds. We get a word from God directly. The truth test for them is God said to me. God told me. Very subjective. So again, as uh, Pentecostalism didn't start with Zuzu Street, um, he, Edward Irving, pushed for the restoration of office of prophet and apostle. The church needed the fivefold gifts of God in order to fulfill the Great Commission. He ended up setting up the seven churches in England that he thought was from Revelation. And only Irvingites were the 144,000, okay? You can see how all these are starting to really veer off. You also needed new revelations where the church is crippled. Baptism for the dead. Where have we heard that teaching? Irving started that, not Joseph Smith. And he rejected justification by faith alone. Regeneration was dispensed through the laying on of the hands of the new apostles. <laughs> he would seal people and that would bring salvation. It can be given to a dead person. And Jesus came in sinful flesh that is still taught in many famous <clears throat> Pentecostal churches. Okay. John Dowie. He's the Elijah. He claimed himself to be Elijah. Why? Because God told him. So again, you're getting this um, move from God's written word to their own imaginations. He founded the Zion Tabernacle in Chicago, and he organized all the modern-day prophets and apostles. And as Edith Blumhofer said, he claimed himself to be Elijah the Restorer. And in 1904, uh, he was told, not only are you Elijah, now you're the first apostle. He denied plenary inspiration. <laughs> he taught that new revelations trumped the written word of God. The Bible was written by men and contained errors. The messages of the new apostles are inerrant and infallible. The main evangelistic message was spirit baptism. They had a song that they would sing as they would enter any town, and it wasn't the gospel. And another quote from him is, the Lord did not complete the work of his redemption in the early church, 
but will affect the thorough redemption from eternal death and destruction through the present impossible. <coughs> so, even Edith Blumhofer, Assemblies of God historian, well, he had novel interpretations of scripture. That should send warning signals in us. He claims God revealed to him that he would save all of New York City through his ministry. I'm from New York. <laughs> No said. Hey, church in Zion goes bankrupt amid financial and sexual scandal for pedophile. This is one of the leaders of the Pentecostal church. His second apostle is Wilbur Oliva. He sets several dates for the second coming of Christ. None of them happen. Charles Parham, probably a more familiar name to those who grew up Pentecostal, he founded. Bethel Bible College. He sought out other Pentecostal leaders and declared himself to be Elijah the Restorer. Then he <laughs> stones Foley, Purim, and Stanford's gospel message, and they start creating a full gospel. Now that sounds great, but it's not. Along the ages, men have been preaching a partial gospel. A part of the gospel remains when the world went into the dark ages, God has from time to time raised up men to bring back the truth to the church. Now he's bringing back Pentecostal baptism to the church, the real Pentecost that's been hidden for all these centuries. And he says the church has been fed on theological tricks, tips. So again, they're, they're thinking they're restoring, they're restoring the ancient church, but they're not. They're coming up with all these new subjective ideas. So, again, they are based on their feelings. The, I'm going to get to this one. The end result of Pentecostalism is either pride, look at how God's using me, or despair, am I truly his? <laughs> That's not a good place for Christians to be. Okay. They're missing the true gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, according to the scriptures, as eyewitnessed by 500 people. None of their miracles or prophecies were witnessed or ever came to be. We are told to contend for the faith, and that's what we're going to get to. So how is Pentecostal evangelism similar to false religions? I think, I feel, or I confess. We do the I confess. Religious experience. If Christianity's truth is based on subjective experience, how does one rightly challenge the experience of Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Mormon, etc.? Because they're based on experience. So Islam relies on visions, dreams, encounters, only Muhammad experience. Subjective. Hinduism relies on ancient texts with no objective evidence and no landing in history. Mormonism relies on vision streets and encounters that only Joseph Smith had. Start to see the parallel theories. Islam began with direct revelation, quick growth in numbers, new prophet, texts of the Old Testament and new or corrupt. Muhammad's dream and visions dictate doctrine, miracles prove text, but happened centuries after the physical and eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection, no documentary proof, beauty of the Quran, and other feelings verify Islam. Pentecostalism, watch the similarities, began with seeking direct revelation, with growth in numbers, modern prophets and apostles, church and Bible corrupt, dreams and visions dictate doctrine, miracles prove their beliefs, a documentary proof on that, and no documentary proof. Feelings and experience verify their teachings. Hinduism, again, watch the corollaries. No historical ties, claims to revelation for Hinduism, vision, stream, ecstatic speech, continued revelation. No creed must be held in order to be called a Hindu. Pentecostalism, Spirit, scriptural accounts are historical. That's a good thing. Claims of direct revelation, vision, dream, static speech, continued revelation, experience, and fellowship over creeds. Mormonism, based on the restoration movement. New prophets, new apostles, direct revelation, subjective proof. I know it's true. I have a burning bosom, right? 
um, Pentecostalism, all the same. How do they know it's true? Their own hymn says it. Jesus lives in my heart. That's how I know he rose from the dead. That's subjective. You, you have uh, already used 45 minutes, I did. so we'll give you 10 minutes more on the it. goodness of our heart. Good. So all of these religions that I have here, except for Christianity, are subjective. They can't be verified. Christianity can. Um, subjective is you know, relinquishes the authority of scripture, presents a broken, weak, and debilitating gospel, relies on those subjective Nations, and who can say whether their prophecies are true or not? Objective truth, God has given us something that's verified. When defending the faith, we must move beyond our experience as quick as possible and get to the facts. Jesus lived in a specific time and place. He was seen, and there is testimony given to this fact. Eyewitness testimony to the crucifixion and resurrection is written and verified. <coughs> this is what we're supposed to proclaim. This is why we demonstrate what we confess, not what I feel, I think, or an opinion. And the objective truth doesn't line up with this biblical pattern. So the modern methods share your testimony. The biblical is you share the Christian testimony. You share the life changes in modern Pentecostalism and gave your life to Jesus. The biblical pattern is Christ's resurrection is according to prophetic scripture. You share how you tell others about these changes. No more drinking, smoking, carousing, dancing, playing cards, all that stuff. Eyewitness testimony is the biblical pattern, and that's what we have to stick with. And so it is the responsibility of the Christian to prove that these Christian faith via objective truth, using our experience only as a jump off point. So I have here some of the objective truths. What does the Bible say? Miracles of Jesus, documentary evidence, and the resurrection. I witness, right? In him, we proclaim. We don't proclaim that testimony. That's not the gospel. We <clears throat> proclaim Christ who lived, died, was buried, and rose again. And why? For the forgiveness of and that's another thing that wasn't dealt with in Pentecostal. That when you got baptized, then your sins weren't forgiven. Um, but not in the sense that we can do this. Boy, what is like to begin by commending uh, Nancy for the choice of a very important topic, more important perhaps than she realized, because this isn't just for Pentecostal. It's one of the phenomena that's really concerning about the last 30 years or so is the Pentecostalization of the Holy Evangelical Movement. So people who don't think of themselves as Pentecostals have learned to think in the same way that you're criticizing. Consequently, uh, you might think about pitching this to a broader audience and rather than purely the Pentecostal. Uh, perhaps that could be done without extensive rewriting, but then the concluding material, uh, it would be possible to point out exactly what you're saying, maybe with some illustrations of that operate. Uh, it wouldn't take more than one oh, chapter to uh, give yourself a lighter perspective. Right. I agree. And the second thing I want to commend you for is that I'm in general uh, agreement and sympathy with your conclusions. I think they are important things that need to be made. <laughs> uh, the questions that follow are purely an attempt to help you strengthen this so that it's even stronger in its next incarnation. Uh, and I'm thinking about pages 47 to 63, which is the fourth place where you deal with Irving, Dowie, and Harlem. 
So my question is, did Irving leave behind any published writings? Yes, they're lost. They were there. And when I spoke with Edith Blumhauer, she said his original, all we have is other people's notations. So in his case, all we have is reports of what he said, right? Secondary school. Is the same thing true of Bowie and Park? So we have a lot of their uh, sermons that were heard in newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the thing that, that really caught my eye was that, uh, and we'll, we'll leave Irving to the side because apparently with him you didn't have to But I found Dowie and Parham conspicuous by their absence from your bibliography and from the footnotes in that section. They're probably under But they need to be there. So primary sources <laughs> are extremely important. Uh, when you're critiquing a person, you need to get it from the horse's mouth, not from reportage by somebody else, insofar as that's possible. Because that way you have had the opportunity to examine it in context yourself. You're not dependent on somebody's interpretation, somebody else's choice about what should be quoted. And so it's good scholarly practice always to quote from primary sources, then use the secondary sources not as your primary information for who these guys were and what they did, but as part of the interpretation. So I would uh, strongly suggest that the actual sources from Valley and Forum be a very significant part of um, And that was really the only significant weakness I saw in, in the whole thing. So I'll let somebody else go back. That can easily be. By not additional documentation on the footnote. Okay, and yeah. of course, including material in the bibliography where it's not provided. And now, oh, if, if there is no way to go beyond this uh, lady that uh, we are so happy with, uh, the one who passed away, uh, you can, nevertheless, you can certainly need to give enough stress on her. Contributions to this, which doesn't take away from your originality of the information at all. What it does is simply make sure that you're using the very best form. And because what you're saying is so good and so important, uh, I really hope you will uh, add Dali and Parham to your bibliography and the notes in that section because. People who are used to evaluating scholarly work, one of the first things they're going to look for is the right kind of use of primary versus secondary. And the absence of it will cause people to dismiss what you're saying, uh, not unfairly because you're actually supposed to do that, but unnecessarily because uh, you actually have a strong Isn't one of the problems with having possibilism? That they call for a decision. <laughs> now that you become an Orthodox Lutheran, you would never do that because that's Arminianism, right? It is. And like I said, I won't share my that. testimony. My pastor has taught me, I look at my baptism for all the benefits that come from that. So you would never ask somebody to receive Christ. I would tell them, as the Bible says, that you need to believe and confess that he is Lord, but the, I think the terminology can get muddy. So I want to be as articulate as possible. And hopefully I was here. Um, because I think make a decision for Jesus kind of leans into you have the power to do that. But you don't have the power to do that. Well, it doesn't have to. Yeah. Because every decision necessarily putting yourself in the place of Christ is, is that what a decision for Christ necessarily entailed? That's how they teach it. That is how they teach that and use that term. So I would try to avoid a term that they have redefined in a very different way. Now, who is they? The about? Holiness Pentecostals, the yeah. Assembly of God, the Southern Baptists. Yeah. They okay. will. Let, 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 let me throw the. Uh, 
say that, is that somehow taking away from God's glory? Uh, in, or is it just possible that the reason that the confessional churches are full of dead orthodox is because nobody has expected them to make any kind of decisions at all? Okay, so we are dealing with someone who has been baptized into Christ, buried with him, and raised with him too, given the true gift of faith. Now, whether that person who's been given those gifts in the water's baptism in the word, if that person is choosing to walk away from that, then yes, at every instance I can, I am going to encourage them to choose to go back to Christ. But that's decision making, isn't it? Right. They've already been <laughs> regenerated. The Pentecostal Assemblies of okay. God Baptist okay. Okay. What about the pagan. Not the pagan, not the Pentecostal. The pagan. Don't you like that person to make a decision? I like that. Is Billy Graham on the wrong track? Yeah. Because he doesn't want to do ever agree with anything Billy Graham did. This is Billy Graham did a lot of great work. Um, he proclaimed the gospel. And that is the power of God unto salvation. Yes, but, he, but he also, he yes. only proclaimed the gospel. He did everything he could to get people to make a decision for that gospel uh, and to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, but it, it, it seems to me you want to be very, very careful here. Uh, there, I've come across some hyper orthodox uh, Lutheran seminary students, for example, who have roundly criticized Billy Graham and anybody else. Who's ever expected decisions? For goodness sake, everybody makes decisions. There's nothing the matter with the decision per se. It depends on the nature of the decision and whether or not we're saying that because I decided, I've really saved myself. But, but I've come across very few Christians who uh, would attribute that quality to their decision making. Okay. This is like Here's the fellow drowning, right? And uh, the lifeguard uh, throws him a uh, life preserver and takes him to show up. Very, very few people say, didn't I do a grand job of getting a hold of that life preserver? If I hadn't done that, my goodness, I would have drowned. No, nobody is right-minded to it that way. My praise the the lifeguard uh, for having done this. And by the same token, I don't think a decision for Christ is per se anthropocentric, you know, self-centered, works righteous. Oh, I think it depends upon whether the person is stupid enough to think that they've accomplished something by this. Okay, so some people that I know still are stupid enough to say something like this, that well, I decided to to try Jesus yeah. to see how that works, yeah. and so they're I, right. I, I apply that to certain people mm -hmm. like that, and they're not just on right. But this is your point that this extends across and across yes. the entire mm -hmm. denominational spectrum where people are 
thinking they can save themselves through experience one from another. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is that there are transition points in life where you, you face truth, you face evidence, and you need to do something about this. And that really is what Ray was talking about. I, I, think, I don't think the night I did not add at all. What I said was there are those of us adult converts who had an experience, but we cannot tell our experience as if it was the gospel. For sure. So that was the focus that it's leaning away from the subjective yes. testimonial yes. onto yes. the objective truths. In fact, as I understand you correctly, you're concerned about the way people like Charles Finney tainted and corrupted the whole decision model. And you fear that leaping over. Dr. Montgomery is saying not everybody who uses that word is necessarily following the model. Would you would you uh, would you say that we can solve this problem by using uh, biblical language and telling people to repent, which is a decision of sorts, and but it avoids it avoids the baggage. If you're not comfortable using the word, mm -hmm. uh, no, so, but, but if you're not, you can't solve the semantic. Mm -hmm. You really got to ask yourself whether there is something the matter with <clears throat> turning around uh, and uh, accepting Jesus Christ. Sure. In, in the book of Acts, the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That is in the aorist of, of the Greek, which means do it now, don't wait for spring. All right? Uh, and uh, that, therefore, the, the concept of making decisions is fundamental in life. Do, do preachers really get up in the pulpit every Sunday and not want to have any impact uh, on the lives of the parishioners so that they really don't change at all? Of course not. If everybody wants to see change in the right direction. It seems to me as long as our decision preaching and decision making and apologetics uh, is Christ centered and not centered upon the psychology of our decisions. Uh, we should not be afraid of it in the least. And I think, too, that the scripture <laughs> clearly says that the gospel, not your testimony, is the power of God unto salvation. For sure. So faith faith he's right. hearing, right. hearing by and, the word of God. And that, that's the focus of my dissertation was that instead of constantly going back to your experiences, which don't save. They may be great stories. They may be exciting. They may even make you a little intrigued. But they don't save. The gospel, God has chosen the gospel proclamation to be his power of salvation. And so, yes, I may sit there with a wayward Christian. Or I may sit there with a pagan. I'm going to give them both the same message. Maybe the way where the Christian gets reminded, maybe back on the right road. And the pagan, I'm going to answer their questions objectively. I can share what God has done in my life, but it may be no different than what they've experienced under Jainism or Sikhism. So it has to be the objective truth because that's where God said, that's where my power is. All right, now let, let me ask just one question. Um, in contemporary theology, it's frequently pointed out that all of your biblical material is really experiential. That is to say that the Bible presents as the record of people's religious experiences. And you are you haven't objectively seen any of those events. What you're doing is relying upon religious experience. It just happens to be somebody else's religious experience. You are taking on board. You swallow this. And now here you are criticizing the whole idea of religion being basically experiential. No, I'm pretty uh, sure how would you answer that? I'm sure we all have 
experience with God. Different levels, different places, um, different times in our life. I'm not negating them because at some point, all of us, even those baptized as infants, at confirmation or beyond, finally said, you know what? This is true. So I'm not negating the experience. What I'm saying is put it in its normal no, but you are giving the impression that the biblical self is somehow objective, whereas all the rest is subjective. Uh, and the argument that's presented in contemporary theology is, as a matter of fact, the stuff in scripture is just as subjective as the rest. It just happens to be subjectivity that you like to make uh, normative. Um, I, I'm just wondering if uh, how you would respond to that. I think Paul and Christians think this totality if Christ goes through that. And he was talking to the church. We have 500 eyewitnesses, most of whom are still alive. They were eyewitness, and, they, and then the apostles, eyewitness testimony. And it's the testimony of the eyewitnesses that supersede anything that we may testify to. That's why I said, you, you have to take that and elevate the testimony in scripture. And yeah, they experienced, they're the ones that were shocked that Jesus wasn't in the tomb anymore. These are all their experiences, but they're documented, they're set in history. And they said, go check the other eyewitnesses. What better proof than 500 eyewitnesses most of whom were still alive? So you are denying the initial premise of that argument that the New Testament has nothing but its own set of mm -hmm. But their experience for us 2,000 years later is objective truth. So, well, am I going to say to you that, you know, I was experiencing visions and dreams and God said this to me? Are you going to believe me? Or when I say, Peter and John ran into the tomb and saw that it was empty. Was that an experience? Yes. But we have it documented. We have it as objective truth now. We have enough testimony that, as Simon Greenleaf said, even in the court of law, Christianity is proven. So I'm not negating experience. I'm saying, don't make that where you are pressing well, your truth piece. To distinguish the various kinds of experience. Right? The experience <laughs> isn't in itself 100% subjective. It depends on, on its reference, references. Uh, just use some historical <laughs> examples. Right? People can say, we don't really know anything about Napoleon. All we have are the experiences of people who had contact with him, and they have spoken about him. Now, uh, we would immediately say, well, yes, and as a matter of fact, uh, there are uh, we seem to be saying so people, and uh, we have all this, all, a whole lot of stuff on Napoleon of that sort, and therefore we assume that Napoleon was <coughs> indeed a person, and that their experiences are validated by of uh, the objectivity of what they're talking about. And that this is different from someone who says, last night, you know, I, I met the truth fairy. <laughs> so it, it seems to me we, we should be very careful and not um, uh, try to um, run down experience per se. We should insist that experience be grounded in solid objectivity <laughs> and, and I mean, we can use uh, non-biblical events uh, as a neat analogy for this kind of thing because of course if one did take that approach of liberal theology to the bible my gosh there wouldn't be any uh, valid historical information available anywhere because all of it comes from, from <coughs> observers 
you've had some kind of an experience in setting the stuff for it, and therefore you would lose all historical knowledge. One of your major thrust is a critique of the misuse of the truth. Yes. Right. right. So say something about the proper and positive role of experience in our testimony in our Well, I'll, I'll It's somebody asking more questions. Okay, I've had neighbors come to me. You know, just simple questions. Why do you go to church all the time? That's now I'm giving my experience why I go. But in my why, it's because there I received the forgiveness of sins. And you can too. So, but there is a place for what God has done for us. But the moment we take those experiences and make them prominent is when we're going to trip and we don't want to do that. We don't want to mess up the opportunities to share the price of that. Okay, I want to if possible, not to describe your own personal experience, but ask the question that has some bearing on the thesis. Can I ask you what one thing can you learn from that? Good. And my absolute missionary zeal. Yes. That right. we don't yes. have. Yes. And that bugs me. Yes. I am in a professional Lutheran church trying to get a missionary couple to visit from Pakistan so people know who they are. Yeah. And the entire district, no response on the emails. That upsets me. I come from Pentecostalism. Right. That had missionary zeal. I got a lot of that. So I'll just say the academy. The first few years had a grand number of Pentecostals. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we trained up in apologetics. Yes. yes, and zeal for the lost was common denominator. Yes, and that's why they're probably here to learn about apologetics. Yeah. 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 yeah, they have non-Christian friends. Mm -hmm. Strange thing. I'm just saying. <laughs> 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 But I'm just saying, place your personal experience in its proper place. Yeah. All right, questions? Yes. In, um, I have a kind of thought about that, but in uh, our private conversation and dealing with people, what would be used or how would you uh, communicate with someone to help them move beyond experience? I always move them to the food. I think it is where we can land them so that they understand what we believe, who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, who the church is. And I think a creedal approach of apologetics, which happens to be a book on the table back there. I don't see you trying to read it with how many different parts throw in. Yeah, I know, they just read the Bible. So I have a chart in my book that actually has the Bible verses for every line of the Apostles' Creed. So if you have a non-Lutheran, non-confessional friend, that's your chart. Here's what it says in the Bible about God, Father, 
maker of heaven and earth and who Jesus Christ is. And in my own experience, that's what I've done. I've done it with neighbors, with kids, and the adults. Yes. Okay, I'll just ask a quick question. Um, so when considering the philosophical politics, for example, we go to the good, the true, and the beautiful. And I'm thinking in particularly of the beautiful as a way into the gospel. That would be a subjective experience. Is there, in your thesis, room for subjective experience as a platform for leading people into the gospel? Uh, there is. I don't discount experience because I've had a lot of view of one. But that's not our point anymore. Because you might not have that drastic black and white. And then I find people want that. And that might not be how that works. You know, he might give you a lightning bolt, but it might just be like Jesus with Nathan under the tree. I saw you under the tree and then he so why don't you just classify what you're talking about as free evangelism? It would certainly be very effective in that regard very important. So the inklings, their writing, you know, all of that is I think very, very important, but it isn't evangelism per se. <laughs> it's bringing them along the road. You might be able to remove a couple of their hurdles. You got to land at the door of salvation, and that's salvation, as Dr. Humphreys would say. And that's where you need the Holy Spirit to do his work. And then they come up with more hurdles to go back to the people. Is the Holy Jedis merely the movie? No. Um, <laughs> I have found apologetics to strengthen my own faith. Is, I, it, is, it, is there a positive? Through apologetics, present affirmative evidence of believing. Absolutely. Can you explain that? Uh, can you use an example. <coughs> um, young boy came across the cul de sac and I helped me pick the strawberries. And we're picking the strawberries, some of them as little really holy balls. He sat with me, we're sorting through them, and he starts asking me about the end times. This is a seven year old boy. Because one of the kids at church at school was talking about it. So I sat with him, explained what happens, and then we talked about the cross. We talked about how his sins could be forgiven and what sins are. All of these are explaining our faith to a seven year old. He said, Why are you a Christian? And I said, Because Jesus died for me, and I believe he died for me, and there's your experience, right? I believe. A year later, he comes back. If I believe in Jesus, does that mean I have two fathers? Yes. So, because you have your earthly and you have your heavenly. But apologetics needs to often be gentle, most of the time gentle, sometimes a little hard, but it needs to even open up the conversation because their need is selfish. It was question back here, we didn't get to one. Somebody was quivering back there. Nancy, <laughs> <laughs> first of all, I want to thank you in terms of the insight and that possible that I had always thought it just went to Zeus' street shortly before that. You made some connections that parallel with Mormonism. I'm wondering if in your research you came across any kind of intersection between mm -hmm. say Charles Russell um, with with precursor to the people of his witnesses with obviously Joseph Smith <laughs> because you mentioned even the New York connection got that burnt out district in which we continually have these constant American religions mm -hmm. coming forward. But I was just curious if there was some overlap in the process just because so much of that seems so familiar from those other groups. The only overlap I found is that it was part of the restoration 
in the early 1800s to restore the gifts to the church of Antioch gifts. They didn't mean salvation. They meant charismatic gifts, visions, dreams. And that's the overlap. So that's why I place Pentecostalism into the Pentecostal movement. Because that's where you overlap. I mean, maybe you already did uh, answer it, but I'm wondering where does testimony, or how would you work in testimony, if at all, about modern miracles? And does that fit into apologetics or evangelism? Like, for example, Professor Williams uh, had that short story about the man from Africa who received the dream, goes to the capital city and finds a missionary. I, I suspect that that kind of thing happens way more often in different cultures, like in African cultures. Than it would in North American cultures, which are more rationalistic. Um, so we're just wondering where a testimony about modern miracles might fit into. So, politics, you know. were 25 years ago, and I'll test it when you said they were all fake. As a student of history, I have found God has worked that way for centuries. Does he do it now? I'm not going to put God in a box. I'm going to go with. Professor Williams said that that's out of my realm. God can. Is it the norm? I don't think it's the norm. And it wasn't the norm in the New Testament. It's just that we have record of all the miracles. So it looks like this was the norm. So it wasn't the norm. And But God can and still does move that way, but always in line with what the Word of God teaches. And when it starts going off, all right. Uh, if we have covered uh, questions, and I noticed that everybody has been awfully nice to Canada, that's all right. We're being decent to Canada. But it's not our style. Uh, yes, I think so. <laughs> so uh, we, we should retire and, uh, and take a look at